Hey, what's up everybody? Chad Kalick here, and welcome back to the Inner Crowded Room Podcast for episode number 106, which we're going to talk about a date, a looming date, that is worrisome for many reasons. It's also a date that I think currently has a lot of incorrect sentiment stapled to it. And I'll tell a story at the end of this podcast that will reference what I'm talking about. Because it's a story that really, I guess, defined who I was as a person. And I think a lot of you are similar to me, which we'll discuss that at the end of the podcast. But the date that I am talking about is my beautiful wife's birthday, July 30th. That's not why I'm talking about it. That's not why I'm bringing it up. I love July 30th, one of my favorite days every year. I love taking care of Laura. I love making her feel as special as she is. But this July 30th could be real scary. Real scary for a couple reasons. The first is that July 30th marks the end of the rent moratorium here in Los Angeles. I believe it's nationwide. I definitely know it's a a looming date that has a lot of people freaked out here. And what the moratorium is, is that's basically where the, the state said you cannot be kicked out of your, you know, apartment or home uh, if you don't pay your rent uh, or your mortgage payment. You can't be evicted. And um, and it's not being forgiven. So over the last three, four months, if people did not pay their rent, it's not like when August comes, you just turn it back on and now you pay it. Uh, now it's still owed. And people don't know yet if that means it's all owed at once or if you have a time period to pay it back. Um, you know, full disclosure, thankfully, again, Laura and I have been blessed enough. We've been able to keep up with our rent payments. So it's not something that necessarily affects us personally, but it does affect us personally in the sense that it affects our city, our town, our neighborhood. And I have absolute empathy for people who are struggling through all of this. Now, from state to state, everything that's going on is different. I realize that. And I can tell because it's funny when I call and talk to, uh, you know, like my aunt or relatives or friends in different states, uh, depending upon the state that you live, the reaction is always different. You know, some of my friends and family are kind of like, oh, yeah, it's no big deal. Everything's, you know, nice and easy around here. But I can tell you, if you live in Los Angeles, it's a madhouse because, you know, no sooner did they get the uh, stores open and businesses open, then they had to shut them back down again, you know, due to the looting and the riots. And then they finally opened them back up again. And then as of yesterday, you know, Gavin Newsom is now saying that looks like they're going to be going to another shutdown again because COVID cases are spiking through the roof, which again has people freaking out. And the reason, uh, the first reason everyone is freaking out about July 30th is you know, we've got to get businesses open. We ha- People have to work, man. We can't just keep shutting things down. You know, th- there has to be a solution at some point. And this, you know, rolling out and then pulling back, rolling out, pulling back. You know, no one really knows what to do. And, and I have empathy for those running the state, too, because no one's ever been here before. But come July 30th, I don't see how they can't extend the moratorium for people because we currently have 60,000 homeless people in Los Angeles. 60,000. So if suddenly they just turn the you know rent payments back on when there's you know un- unemployment is at like, you know, 15% as high as in some counties, 20-25% uh, I, I don't understand, you know, they can't flood the streets with homeless, you know. Uh, we're already there. There's a, we're already at capacity, right? We're well over capacity, you know, especially with L.A.'s rat problem. I mean, literal rats. The rat population is 12 times greater than it should be. We're on the verge of a major breakout of the Black Plague. I'm not kidding. Like, I did a podcast about this. Google it. Like, the... LA is in bad shape, guys. I am not comfortable 
living here right now. And I'm, that's the best way I can put it for you. I, I'm dead serious. It is, I am not comfortable living in Los Angeles right now. Plus, the whole thing is a, a, a tinderbox for civil unrest. You know, we are one video away from this town just going up in smoke, man, because people are freaked out right now. I mean, people are freaked out. And I see it in everyday life. I see people fighting on street corners. I see breakout fist fights in grocery stores because, you know, one guy thought another guy was too close to him. One guy, you know, thought the other guy should have an actual face mask on rather than a bandana, and that caused the fight. Uh, certain businesses will let you in. Other businesses won't. Uh, certain businesses are totally lax about the policies of the face mask. Other businesses aren't. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, you know, the big thing is financially people are freaked out, you know. People are freaked out, and I get it. I completely understand why. They were forced to stop working and now the job that they were forced to quit in a lot of cases in almost 50 percent of those cases that job no longer exists so now people are looking at july 30th going whoa okay so now covid cases are spiking again they're now worse off than they were when this whole thing began and we're heading now towards july 30th and no one's addressing it yet no one's saying, okay, let's push this back further. And, you know, people don't have that money because only 1200 bucks has been sent back to people, you know, as far as a stimulus check goes. And, you know, in most cases, that didn't do anything. I mean, I could tell you right now, in Santa Monica, California, $1,200 could not pay rent anywhere for even one month. You know, full disclosure, um... You know, I'm not going to you know, lay out all my bills, but I can tell you that, I'll just put it this way, in my neighborhood, um, I have a what's considered a one and a half uh, bedroom, which I have what is considered an oversized apartment in Santa Monica. Um, most apartments in Santa Monica are either are bachelors uh, or um, a loft or just a one bedroom. And those start, the rent starts at 2500 a month. So $1,200, you know, in what's called uh, the West Bay in, of Los Angeles, that didn't, that does jack nothing. I mean, that's nothing. And even downtown, you know, where Skid Row is, uh, you know, bachelors and studios there are right around that, about $1,500. So um, that's a real issue. July 30th is coming, and the rent issue is a big one. And um, as of right now, no one's talking about it, man. It's got people on edge. It has people on edge. Now, the other issue, the other reason why July 30th is really scary, and I think this one is an even bigger issue, uh, because I think it's been, you know, I think the country has been as unstable as things are, it's actually more stable than I thought it would be at this point. And I underestimated one thing because I, I didn't know about it. And once I knew about it, then I was like, oh, okay, now I see what's going on. Um, okay, so unemployment. And you guys may already know about this. I, you know, I, I learned about this about two and a half, three weeks ago. Um, for those that apply for unemployment for, I believe it's 12 weeks there is an additional $600 paid on top of the standard unemployment wage. So I know it's different from state to state, but in California, if you're out of a job and you apply for unemployment and you get the full margin, which is $450 a week, um, and what you have to, you have to make over $18,000 a year. If you make over $18,000 a year, for unemployment, they will give you four fifty a week. Well, part of the CARES Act added um, thirteen. It was thirteen payments of an additional six hundred dollars. So, for thirteen weeks, if you're on unemployment, uh, you will receive over just over a thousand dollars a week, or four thousand a month. 
Now, when I heard that, a bunch of things started to make sense to me. Um, first off, thank God, because that makes it, because the whole time I was going, you know, how is, I mean, I realized the, the riots were not a surprise. The looting was definitely not a surprise. But A, I thought the looting would have came earlier. And I thought that it would have continued at a, a stronger rate than it is. And just so you guys know, I, I know the national media is not picking up on it. But looting has been going on every day in Los Angeles. It, it's not stopped. Because um, I have a lot of friends. Again, I was talking to a buddy of mine back home in Des Moines uh, that was saying, well, man, that looting was crazy there, man. At least they got that under control. And I'm like, that's not under control. No, that's still going on. It's not going on at the rate that it was when Santa Monica just imploded. But, oh, no, it's going on every day here. There are new businesses and new areas every day that are being looted, and there's still riots going on, but they're just smaller scale. It's happening every day. But I honestly thought when the government said we're, we're you know, sending out $1,200 checks, and then, you know, they're saying, yeah, you'll get it in three, four, five months from now, I was thinking... Oh man, this city's going to burn. Like, I mean, and every other major city that has to deal with this. Because, again, let's rewind the tape here. The government said you can't work, took away the jobs of people, sent them home, and said, not only can you not work, you have to stay inside your house. You can't associate with friends. You can't, you know, you can't go to the beach to sit down. Which I guess all this goes out the window if you want to fucking protest, I guess. So, um, but you know, and then businesses were shut down, and then people were just put in the worst possible position they could possibly be put in by no fault of their own. And then the government said, "Well, here's twelve hundred bucks." So I thought, "Well, this is going to get really, really bad." And then I heard forty million people are now. Um, on unemployment, which thank God they should be. Thank God. And thank God this other program exists, which is basically, you know, paying the maximum uh, where you can get $4,000 a month, basically. Which, to be honest, in I, I don't know, I mean, I do know roughly in smaller towns in Iowa and like rural areas, $4,000 a month can go a long way. Um, but in major cities, I would think at a bare minimum, I mean, just to survive in Los Angeles, and I mean survive, like if I was a single person and I had to just pay for rent, uh, groceries, monthly insurance, gas, which is, has always been exceptionally expensive out here, I mean, I would think at minimum, at minimum, You'd have to do four to five thousand a month uh, just to survive. You know, if you were a single person that said, "Okay, I'm, I'm one person. I'm going to have a studio." Most artists that I know are living, you know, four to five people in a one to two bedroom. Like that's it's college style living. Uh, most married couples I know, um, if they're somewhat successful, uh, meaning if they have you know, a piece of, I guess, career real estate. If they've found something they do well and they're hooked up with a good gig, uh, if they're married, they live on this side of the hill. They're on the, the, the West Bay. Um, if they're just starting or if, you know, their job isn't that great, if they're just they're, they're building their career, uh, most married couples live kind of deep in the valley because that's when you start getting to prices where you can get a one bedroom for around, you know, thirteen, fourteen hundred, maybe as low as a thousand. If you really look, you can get a bachelor for maybe. And when I say a bachelor, that's if you guys don't know, a bachelor is just uh, a room. You know, like a a toilet and a room. Like no kitchen, no closet, no just a you know four walls <laughs> and a shitter. Like that's a bachelor. You know, you can get that in the valley. In a semi-safe neighborhood for seven, eight hundred a month, you know, um, 
so yeah, I think you know you would have to have four to five thousand, I think, to live on this side of the hill. If you're in the valley, about yeah, three to four thousand a month just to survive for one person. Um, so twelve hundred dollars, I just isn't going to do it. But when I heard that you know unemployment is basically paying out four thousand dollars a month for at least three months. Uh, and I guess it's retroactive. So like if you, if someone applied today and they said, okay, I'm going to get unemployment today, uh, they will date it back to at some point in March and, uh, they'll get that all at once in one payment, uh, which is great to hear because I was just reading a story in uh, the LA times about a guy who he just found out about it and he lost his job. So he applied for unemployment. He was freaking out. He was thinking, I'm going to lose everything. And um, he got on unemployment and, and it retroactively dated back to March. And so he got a check, you know, from March all the way up till now, which was for like eight and a half thousand dollars, which saved him for basically two months. Uh, that gave him a, a, a two month window to try to find work in his specific career field. And he was a guy that actually worked in the industry. The, the profile was about, uh, so he's going to have a tough time because uh, just so you guys know, this is how screwed up things are in my industry, the entertainment industry. Um, the bold and the beautiful, the TV show that just started filming, just opened up its doors to the studio last Wednesday. Uh, Crews, film crews, like reality TV crews, traveling crews, like all that stuff, none of that's going on. None of that's going on. I mean, I, I've heard that it, it could be happening as soon as next week, but, you know, I, I'm the insiders that I'm talking to are saying, oh, man, no, we're looking at, like, August. Uh, just because all of the, um, you know, all the guilds, all the unions, there's all kinds of safety issues that are going on. Um, there's... You know, every one of these companies are afraid of being sued and, you know, sending a film crew back onto an airplane like, you know, go film in Florida right now, you know, or go film in Texas or Louisiana or L.A. All the hot, all the hot uh, film markets, all of them are, you know, rocket spiking with COVID right now. And none of these film companies or television companies uh, look, there's no there, there's no legal legislation that protects them from any kind of you know liability. Uh, so I, I get it, you know that they, they don't want sued, and at the same time, uh, you know the the crews and the union crews and the actors and and all those they also don't want to be you know told you're under contract, you have to go and work here if there is a legitimate health concern. Uh, so they want the ability to sue if something like that were to happen. So what it's created is gridlock. And um, so, yeah, it's just it's a bad, bad situation. But the thing that concerns me the most is this six hundred dollars is supposed to end on July 30th. Now. When that ends. Now we're going to see the effects of what's been going on because look, 40 million people are on unemployment, 40 million. And from all those people, you're going to take away $600, you know, per week, $2,500 a month. Um, Yeah, I mean, at that point, oh, and by the way, if you haven't been paying rent up to this point, it's going to be due, and, and landlords are now going to be able to toss people out. I don't, you know, look, man, this is, I said this a couple of weeks ago to Laura when it was weird because I was turning on the news and I was watching everybody protest, and I'm going, why is everybody acting like shit's just cool? Like, we just saw the world go haywire over this COVID in a way that it's never done in history. We saw the world go haywire. And then it was almost like, you know, Trump and his team uh, decided we got to open shit. 
We got to open the country. And I get it. I, I mean, they're like, I've said, if you guys have been listening to my podcast, I've been more on that side of saying that, yeah, we got to get this going. We have to get this rolling. We have to consider, you know, I think Trump said it a while ago. And, you know, remember, guys, when I bring up Trump, this isn't a for or against. You know, sometimes you'll hear me criticize him. Sometimes you'll hear me praise him. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm somebody who looks at every scenario and just says, what makes sense, you know? And, and Trump a while ago said the cure, you know, can't be worse than the disease. And I, and I look at it that way. And I'm saying, you know, if, if you know, the staying in and crashing the economy in the long term will, you know, destroy more lives through financial reasons and, and reasons of stress and instability and civil unrest. Like, we have to weigh that versus, you know, going the path of herd immunity and, you know, allowing people to either avoid it or get it. And I am the first to say, man, it's a flip of a coin type decision. You know, it, it's tough. You know, I'm just looking at it from a scenario that we we can't, that there has to be a country, right? There has to be a backbone. There has to be financial institutions. The banks have to stay open. You know, we have to have food. We have to have people to work to bring in food. Like we, we, we you can only shut so many institutions down for so long before there just isn't anything happening. Now, I think... Uh, you know, what's really fucking wild about all this is that there is such a, a massive, uh, you know, difference in income where the top 1% have been able to just, you know, keep the stock market propped up throughout all of this when every economic strategist in the world said, this does not make sense. We have record high unemployment but yet the stock market is recovering at a rate as though nothing ever happened. Now that's because it's just propped up by massive spending of very wealthy people who saw stocks that were, you know, that initially fell through the floor that were worth way more than what they were when they were low. So you get a ton of buying. I mean, the one, the one, you know, I'm not a, a, a stock market genius, but the one thing I do know is that when the stock market goes up, that just means there's more money being invested into it. So when you see the stock market going down, people are pulling money out of it. When you see it growing, they're putting money into it. So once the market initially crashed after the fear of COVID, you know, and everybody kind of felt like, the wealthy kind of felt like, oh, well, we can get through this. We're going to be okay. And it's actually a ripe business, you know, time. So they're buying back in and they're propping up, you know, the, the stock market through all of these stocks that are very low. And that kept the stock market up. But every every financial strategist out there says, man, this is this is like the equivalent of a bubble. Like, we're going to see the effects of this sooner or later. And I think the effects are going to happen when they strip away that $600. And when those, uh, you know, when the... Uh, the rent moratorium goes away because when that, when the, if those two things happen simultaneously, I don't know what anybody is to expect anybody to do. If you can't get a job, if your old job doesn't, you know, exist, well, you know, what do, what are you to do? I mean, I think that's when we're going to see the tinderbox explode and Oh man, I hope I hope they have a better plan, you know, uh, because we can't let that happen. Our country is in a volatile, volatile state right now, and I mean we're one video away from you know, what could be a race war, man. I mean, I I have real concerns about that. That's a whole other podcast, but I can tell you this: when the election comes, Trump is already already taking the stance that it's rigged through mail-in votes and it's going to be rigged. If he loses, if he loses, oh man, I, I fully predict that there will be an absolute war in the streets in America if he loses. Uh, from 
from those who feel like, you know, it was stripped from him. Um, but that's a whole other, you know, podcast. The one thing I do want to bring up is in regard to this $600 payment, you know, I just watched all kinds of debates about this on the news. And I keep hearing the same thing that, you know, the head of the Fed right now is saying, please, government, extend these $600 payments. This is actually helping the economy. It's keeping, you know, money is moving at the consumer level. It's keeping people in their homes. It's actually helping to stabilize the economy at, at a, you know, a greatly unstable time. Please do not take that away until there is a cure for COVID. Uh, because the thing is, too, if you just take it away, it's not like someone could just find a job next week. Like jobs are gone. Like the job market is has taken a massive hit. So for tons of people, it's not as simple as just going, oh, I want to go back to work. And the argument that I keep hearing over and over again is, well, we need to take this away because... We're incentivizing people to stay home, that we're paying them $4,000 to not have a job. And they're assuming because people are making uh, either the same or in some cases more money through unemployment, the immediate response is, well, that's what they want. That's better than if someone was making $3,000 a month while they were employed and they're making $4,000 a month through this, you know, pandemic, then they're never going to want to go back to work again because they're making more on unemployment. And I keep hearing this. I keep hearing this. And maybe I am just a different person, but I don't buy into that. I don't buy into the fact that anybody wants to just be paid by the government to do nothing and they don't want a career and they don't want upward mobility and they don't want the opportunity to grow and they don't want to go do things, interact with people and meet people. I just keep hearing this whole concept that like it just, it just assumes that everyone is lazy and people have no ambition and I just don't buy it. I just don't believe that people are content with that, that if you're, you know, suddenly making money from the government from not working, that you're like, man, this is a great scenario. I want to stay locked into this. I want to get $4,000 a month to do nothing and just sit around. Like, that's not a fulfilling life. And I don't know where this viewpoint came from, that that's what people want. And on the flip side... Look, if someone is making a little more money off unemployment than they made when they were working in this specific instance, good. No one, like nobody asked for this. People were ordered home. They were forced to lose their job. I mean, how fucked up is it that the government would be like, you can't work. You got to go home. You lose your job. Okay, here's unemployment. It's a little bit more than what you were making. You just want that, though, don't you? No one wanted this. No one asked for this. No one was sitting around looking for a way to go, you know what? How do I get my government to pay me more in unemployment? You know, and I realize there's exceptions to the rule, you know, in in outliers in every situation. But I think the bulk of the country as a whole You know, America is is a place of opportunity. You know, all my friends, everybody I know, we're all trying to to make it. We're trying to get to that place in life that we want to be. That, you know, that, that finish line where we go, man, I built a career. I built a legacy. And you can't build any of that shit collecting checks from the government. But I watched Mitch McConnell said that. He was just like, you know, one of the things we're not going to do is sit around and pay people to stay home. You sent them home. You sent them home. You took away their job and you sent them home. And now if the math comes out that they might make a little more, you know, than they were making through unemployment, well, let's make sure we shore that shit up. They should be just as poor. And if they're making a little more, they want to stay home. That's what's going on here. So let's strip that away, make sure they stay poor, And then let's pull this 
rent moratorium. <laughs> like, what is going on? You know, I just don't believe that people, just because they're making more off unemployment or even equal, that that necessarily incentivizes them to not work. People like, you know, fellowship. They like working. They like feeling fulfilled when they do something that they're good at. Our country was built upon that. You know, it just assumes the worst out of a human being when they're just making blanket statements like, well, we, we can't pay the $600 because everybody just wants cash to sit home. I don't, I don't, I personally don't know anybody that just wants cash to sit home. I know there are some people like that. I get it that there's low lives in every society that don't want to contribute and just want to sit around. But remember, this situation was not caused by society. Society was thrown into this situation against our will without any say. And the reason, you know, I, I have experience with this. I'm speaking from experience, guys. I'll tell you a little story. And, I'll, and I will be fully transparent here about some of the numbers uh, because you would think that if this was true, that if people make a lot of money to do nothing, they'll be happy. You'd think I would have felt a very different way about the situation I'm about ready to uh, describe to you. Uh, a long time ago, back in 2005, I've spoke about this before, just back in the MySpace days, this producer was just hounding me on MySpace from a company called Tijuana Films to come in and meet with them because they had this reality show and it was a pilot and somehow they went over my page and they just thought I was right and I turned it down three times because at that point I was not interested in being on camera and the third time I wrote back and said listen I'm a filmmaker I know I'm in videos but like that's what I do that's what I'm interested in they said perfect this is that's why we want you to come in so long story short I go in I meet with them they're saying, trust us, you're going to want to do this show. It's going to be amazing. Uh, it's kind of like the real world meets uh, indie filmmaking. It's a competition, but you, you live together uh, with filmmakers, and it involves a really big celebrity. So you're going to want to do it. And I'm like, huh, well, okay. So I agreed to do it. Uh, I went in, uh, long story short, craziest, like the, the, this run I'm going to describe here is like the craziest like three week run of my life, but it ends up being Drew Barrymore. Uh, Drew Barrymore is the executive producer of the show. It was a VH1 show. Uh, it was a blast. It was uh, basically we had to recreate iconic music videos on indie budgets. And, I, and when I say indie budgets, I mean indie budgets, like $200. And they would have the original artist come, and the original artist would pick the winner um, based on what he liked the most. And the first one we did was a recreation of the uh, video for Devo, uh, Whip It, Whip It Good. That song, dun, 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 dun. Mm -mm. when a problem comes along, you must whip it, like that song. Um, and we did it, and I, I, I got lucky. I ended up winning the pilot episode, and I got to meet Drew. Like I said, she was the executive producer, and it was super cool and exciting. And I was told, go home, and we'll tell you what happens if the pilot gets picked up. That's how this works, right? A lot of these shows, they shoot a pilot, they take it back to the network, and you got to see what's going to happen. So uh, either way, I thought it was a great experience. It was fun for eight days. I lived inside uh, this is basically an airfield uh, like shed that was outfitted with all these Final Cut Pro uh, racks and we had bunks there and, and we all just lived together basically. And outside of filmmaking, it was, yeah, it was just like a social experiment. And they clearly casted me as like the indie guy, the tattooed hard rock indie guy. And they had like the, you know, uh, bouffant hair dude, New York Tim Burton type filmmaker. They had the uh, Middle Eastern filmmaker. Uh, they had the USC, you know, Golden Boy filmmaker. Like I could clearly see what they were doing, you know. Um, but it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. So I shot it, went home, and at that time I had just finished. Uh, about two months earlier, I'd finished Paranormal, which was my first paranormal documentary. Um, it was going viral online, and there was a, a lot of uh, conflict between. Uh, the guy that I did it with, and I just got to a point where 
these contracts weren't working out and they weren't fair and I had to walk away. And I was super bummed out that I had to walk away from it because I really liked the process and the people involved. But I, I prayed about it and I just said, I got to get out of here. I can't, I cannot be screwed. So I, 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 I left this contract, walked away and through a really crazy turn of events through an old friend that I went to college with, I ended up the following day, I ended up interviewing for this project, uh, for a Steven Spielberg project called The Rising. Um, like there was like a hundred different directors uh, interviewed for it. Like the director of the Dixie Chicks documentary was leaving as I was walking in. And it was just one of those rare, true Hollywood knock it out of the park moments where uh, I, I sold myself as hard as I could and I ended up getting the deal. And I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. I land this gig. And uh, at the time, it was going to be not only a social media platform, but the, this is back in 2005. So there was no, in 2005, there was no online, full-on, half-hour episode reality series. It was right at the moment where people were thinking, this is possible, uh, you know, it, it, encoding was getting to the place where, you know, pretty soon it was you were going to be able to download large files really fast. And uh, it was right at the time where big corporate sponsors like Mount, and Monster and, and Ford and Sony, Pepsi were just getting involved in original content. And at that time, uh, for a TV show... Uh, we, we had a budget that was going to be crazy. I mean, it was upwards of $20 million uh, for an internet show. Uh, to put that into perspective, an episode, a, a season of 10 episodes of um, Paranormal State, a 10-episode season of Paranormal State would be around $5 million. So this was going to be a 10-episode season of an online show you know, four times we got like almost $20 million. So it was a very pricey project, very experimental. Um, and one of our sponsors was Ford. And, you know, this was like such an amazing time. And my first contract that I got for the first year is actually, they actually, there was options built in. But the first year that it went around, uh, full disclosure, the contract that I had was for $250,000. So it was twenty five thousand dollars a month, which at that time I had never seen money like that in my life. Uh, you know, I had some paydays from different individual projects that did well, but never anything like that. I mean, that was like wow, holy shit! And not only that, I'm literally working with directly with Spielberg. So this is like you know the time of my life. I'm like this is everything that I wanted to do. And I moved to L.A. I'm doing something new and exciting, which. If you followed me in my career, I'm all about different, you know, like give me the next new cutting edge thing. I was one of the first filmmakers to say, hey, I want to offer all my films digitally. I was doing that back in 2005, man, before anybody was doing it now. Um, I was always into the web, always understood the power of it. And I'm thinking here, I'm doing something I love with the paranormal, working with the filmmaker that inspired me to become a filmmaker. And I'm doing it in an online format that's going to be cutting edge that nobody has done before. So we went out and we shot two episodes of it. And that's when it was in 2000, uh, at the end of 2006, right at the beginning of 2007. And that's when the banking industry collapsed. Remember when all the banks collapsed? I was literally... In Louisiana, in New Orleans, the day that the banks collapsed. So when it, when it, literally that morning when it came out that, oh my God, like they're all going under. And we were all like, what does this mean for us? Oh my God, we knew it wasn't good. Um, so we wrapped up our second shoot. We had done two episodes and we were told we had to come home and we had four planned. And money was moving. I mean, we were sending money out. Uh, constantly our, our, our per episode budget was through the roof and, you know, we had already paid, uh, location fees for all kinds of future episodes. Like it, we, we were, it was on, you know? And so I come back and everything just goes on stall. And then we heard that Ford, who was our biggest underwriter, um, Ford, the Ford Flex, which was like the biggest 
gas guzzling vehicle, the largest truck Ford, uh, Ford had ever made, was our primary sponsor. Well, when the banks collapsed, if you remember also, gas prices went to like $6 a gallon. And Ford knew they were not going to be selling the Ford Flex. So they ended up pulling their uh, budget and everything went haywire. And so I was still under a contract and my contract was guaranteed. So for the rest of that year, uh, I couldn't do anything and it was exclusive. So I sat home and I'm thinking, okay, well, I I'm getting, you know, paid a lot. So uh, they'll get this worked out. You know what I mean? They're giving me this much money. So obviously they're not just going to throw it away. You know, if you've got to spend this much cash, you know, you're pot committed, right? So you invested. I'm thinking they got to figure this out. You know, what I didn't know at that time is what's a lot of money to me is not a lot of money to multi-billionaires, right? When you're worth, you know, 60 billion $250,000 doesn't scare you. The, you know, the, they lose that at lunch. You know, like it, it's not a big deal, um, which I didn't know at that time. Um, but my point being is when that year was over, um, at that time, there was three different companies that, that owned the show. There was Yahoo, and then there was uh, Amblin, and then there was, man, cars are going crazy outside. There was Yahoo, Yahoo Amblin, and I forget the third company. It was Terry Simmel's company. There was three companies that owned it, basically. And they wanted to buy the rights to Rising from Yahoo and bring it uh, over to Amblin and this, this third company with, with Terry Simmel. And Terry Simmel, by the way, uh, one of the wealthiest men alive, uh, Steven Spielberg's close friend, one of the top Hollywood investors uh, of, of all time, the former president of Yahoo. He created Yahoo Originals former president of Warner Brothers. So these are the guys that I'm working with at that time. Now, admittedly, I'm not working with them on an everyday basis. I would see them once every two or three months, and we'd go over where we were at with everything. And they would kind of let me know, uh, and Drew, the guy I was working with, more him than me, uh, you know, what direction we got to go, and we'd go to work on it. Um, but it was awesome because I did get at least, you know, a first name, uh, you know, relationship with these guys. Um so when my year was up, I'm thinking, well, this sucks because this year is almost up and this isn't resolved yet. And I don't know what's going to go on right now. Um, but I guess it's time for me to go kind of test the market. Well, at that time, I had already befri be befriended Ryan Buell. And I, we knew to some degree that we wanted to work together. And we had already been trying to work it out. And initially, Rising was like, hey, no way. You're not going to go you know, be on any other paranormal show, we're paying you a lot of money to be exclusive, so you've got to chill. And I'm like, okay, well, initially, because it was early on, I was like, okay, that's fine. Well, at the same time, remember that Drew Barrymore show? That show ends up getting picked up. And they call me, and they're like, congratulations, dude. You know, the show got picked up, and we want you for sure. So, are you stoked? And I'm just like, uh, yeah, I want to do it. That would be so much fun, but... I can't do it. And they're like, well, why? This is an amazing opportunity for you. And we love you. And Drew loves you. And I'm like, well, um, oddly enough, I'm working for Drew's godfather. And Drew's godfather is Steven Spielberg. And I was like, so unless she can convince him to let me come do this, I, I, I don't know that I could do it. Because they, they, they got me under this exclusive contract. And so I couldn't do that. I couldn't do the first season of Paranormal State. So season two rolls around and we're at the very end of this one year contract where they're just paying me a ton of money to do nothing. They get to the very end of that year contract and I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to go and do Paranormal State. And they came back and they said, no, for another 10 months, we want to contract you because we think we're going to get this worked out. And I just didn't have the confidence but I was like, man, for 10 months, I was like, you're going to pay me the same thing? Well, they ended up, they didn't pay me the same thing, uh, but they did give me 18000 a month. So it was a contract for another 10 months that was exclusive where I could only do something if they gave me permission to do it. Now, you would think that I would just love sitting around being paid to do nothing. Right? That's all I keep hearing from 
Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell and all these people that are saying, all these guys that are getting $4,000 a month right now, if that's more money than they ever got before, they love it. They, they'll just sit home. They don't want to work. Why would they ever go back to work? You know, completely dismissing the aspect of life that I was staring at, which I ended up signing for the 10 months, thinking that I could, I could sign for that, and in a perfect world, I would get them to allow me to still do the Drew Barrymore show, which they did not. And then at the very end of that 10 months, they finally, because they knew the Rising show was going to go away, they finally gave me permission to do my first couple episodes of Paranormal State. But guys, let me tell you something. That 10 months was horrible. It was horrible. Financially, it wasn't. I mean, I was at that time, I had a lot of debt. And I had a lot of things to, to you know, to pay off of. And I actually, I, I rebuilt my studio at that time and my edit bay. And it was so overdue anyways. And we invested in some camera gear, which, you know, in my line of work, every two years, you have to, you know, reinvest in your cameras and your computers. It's just at the rate of technology. If you want to stay up with everybody, you have to reinvest. So basically, it allowed me, you know, it paid my rent for a couple of years and it allowed me to. Uh, knock off some debt and reinvest and and but guys it was horrible because you know what I didn't do in that one year the first year that they contracted me and then 10 months after okay so we're talking 22 months of my life I, I, nothing happened I went nowhere career-wise I mean yes I had these connections but it doesn't matter because I couldn't use them and the show that I was on basically got sidelined. So the idea that just sitting at home and collecting checks is somehow fulfilling and people don't want to work, I would have given anything <laughs> to work. Anything. It killed me to sit at home and just collect checks and be told, sit on your hands. I know this other TV show wants you to be on it, I know you want to go be on it. I know Paranormal State makes total sense for you right now. But like the first couple, couple times I asked, they shot me down. You know, in fact, I remember there was a point where I almost got fired because they were like, hey, you know, why do you even know that they want you to be on the show? Why are you even talking to them, dude? You were under contract with us. Who the fuck are you powwowing with? You know what I mean? They were like, you shouldn't even know if they want you. You shouldn't know their schedule you are exclusively under contract to us, and we are paying you handsomely. So why are you in that camp? You know? Now, I, I was honest with them. I told them, I just said, because I'm going crazy. I am going crazy. Just sitting here and doing nothing? I'm not building my career. Yes, you are paying me money, but I'm not doing anything. And I learned that about myself, that I don't, my goal in life is to not sit on my hands. My goal in life is to not just get checks and go, wow, I'm getting paid. And I don't believe that there's any overall, you know, massive risk that just because people are collecting unemployment checks at a time where they were sent home and had their jobs stripped from them, that if they're getting more money from unemployment, either just above or just under that that's what people want, that that incentivizes them to stay home. I don't believe that. I, I don't believe that people are incentivized to stay home by making a little more or a little less than what they made before. I think part of the reason people work jobs is they want upward mobility. They want to know that they're building towards something in life, and they want control of their life. They don't want the government to control it. Most people, I think I'm, I think I'm speaking for most people. You guys can tell me what you think, but I believe that most people, not all, most people want to work a job. Most people want to build something of their own. Most people want, you know, enjoy fellowship. They enjoy friendship. They enjoy the social structure of work. They enjoy, you know, putting their name on their, 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 I love a Chad Kalick film, man. You know, there you go. There's my ego. Well, you know, <laughs> when a film's done and I know it's got my trademark and I slap a Chad Kalick film on it, 
and produced by Thomas Lee Bottom and produced by Justin Holstein. And I, and I know that's our, I love that, man. And why shouldn't I, man? I spent 20 years of my life, you know, trying to become good at something, you know, trying to become the best in the world, you know, or at least amongst the elite at what I do. Why in the hell would it, would I want to just sit home and not use those talents? That was the worst part about, you know, making that money. I mean, collectively, you know, 250000 plus 180000 so 250000 350000 but, you know, $430,000 was made from that scenario. After taxes, you got roughly half of that. Uh, but still, that you, you know what that was? Money to not do anything. You know, they just bought almost, you know, two years of my life that nothing happened. And if I could give it, give it back, I would have. If I could do it all over, I would have not, I would have taken way less money to be non-exclusive. I would have said, listen, man, just whatever. Give me, you know, your typical monthly hold fee of a thousand a week, but I can do whatever I want. Yes, I will do your project, but I can do whatever I want. Well, that's not how it works with Spielberg Projects. When you're going to work with Spielberg, you don't, you know, how it just, yeah, it, it, you're, you're, you belong to that project. And, uh, which was awesome when it was working. It was the best ever. I got a real taste of what it's like to work in that environment. Every plane flight was first class. Every hotel was five star. Um, you know, the per diems alone were ridiculous, you know, per diem is what you get. Like when you go out and film on a set. And usually on most film sets, you know, you get fifty, sixty dollars for per diem. That's food per money per per day for you to buy your own meals or your own what, however you want to use it in that day. I mean, the per diems that I was getting, you know, was like two hundred fifty bucks a day to spend on meals. You know, I mean, so it was crazy. I mean, that that whole world to this day, I've never seen anything like it. Like, I would get off a plane. You know, to be picked up by a car on the tarmac and his private jets uh, uh, to uh, Silicon Valley to visit with the the, the heads over there of yacht. I mean, it was it was incredible, man. And and when all that stopped, and it was like, now sit on your hands, man. For the next year and a half of just sitting still, I don't believe that's what people want. I think that to just out of the blue stop paying that money to people who need it under the guise that people are lazy and they just want to sit home and collect checks, completely removing the fact that nobody asked for this. Those 40 million, you know, people that are on unemployment, they didn't ask for this. It's not like they all got there because 40 million people decided, I'm just lazy, I want to go collect checks. The government forced them into this situation. Forced them. So the thinking that if there's some people that are making more, we got to shore that up and make sure they're equally, you know, wherever they were at before. That's ridiculous, man. So I hope they continue this. There's some people that say they're going to have to. Some people that say they're not going to. But for the people that are receiving it, if you haven't got back on your feet, I think most people, I, I definitely think if somebody is on unemployment and they know they can get their old job back and make the same amount, I think 9 out of 10 people would want to do that. Am I wrong? Do you guys think I'm wrong? Let me know in the comments what you think about this. But I just, and again, maybe, maybe I'm just different. I have no desire to be on anybody's tit. You know, I have no desire. I just, the, the worst, the worst fate ever would be, yeah, Uncle Sam's going to pay you to, to sit around. Don't do anything. Just collect checks and sit home. That doesn't sound like fun to me, you know, and, and I don't think anybody will take pride in that. Um, and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with collecting unemployment either, man. That's what it's there for. If you're in trouble and you need help, man, our government should help. Look how much money we pay into shit. Jesus, man, our, our government should help people. And they're not, man. I mean, $1,200 to the people, that's a joke. That's a joke. That alone should be a reason why the $600 should continue. Because they only gave people 1200 it's going to take people a while to get back on their feet if the jobs exist. And right now, the coronavirus thing is spreading like wildfire again. 
the mismanagement on the government level is just ungodly in this whole thing. Absolute failure. Absolute failure in the way this is all being handled. And I see why our country is a tinderbox. So July 30th, watch that date, man. That's a scary date. Because if suddenly people just can't make the money to pay their bills and the moratorium is lifted at the same time, you're going to have a combination of two things colliding. One, people losing the majority of their income. Two, people being evicted at a mass rate. If that happens, keep your doors locked tight, everybody. You know, keep your doors locked tight. Hopefully that won't happen. I will keep praying for the best, but I just wanted to share that. I believe in you, my friends. I believe that all of us want to build a life and that we don't want to be on the check program. But if we need it, we need it. There's nothing wrong with that. If people need it, they should have it. But I firmly believe that people want to build their own, uh, you know, their own thing. People want to have their own legacy and they want upward mobility and they want to own and control, you know, their future. And there's just no, yeah, yeah, there's just no emotional benefit to sitting around like that. So I don't believe that. I don't believe that if people make that money, they'll be incentivized to stay home. But again, I want to know what you guys think. Much love, everybody. Once again, thank you all for listening, and I will be back tomorrow with more. All the best.